right, fantastic. And I think the next lecture, we're actually going to swap the second and third. So I think the one that should be coming up now is on thoracic lymph nodes by Anne Leung from Stanford. Fantastic. Pleasure for me to participate in this resident boot camp. I'd like to begin this presentation by citing an old adage, if we don't look, we won't see, that I think is particularly applicable to us in radiology. During this presentation, I'm going to explore some fundamental questions as to what, how, and where to look as a means to help you develop a comprehensive and efficient approach for evaluation of thoracic lymph nodes on CT. So what is a lymph node? As we all know, lymph nodes are organs of the lymphatic system. Anatomically, they are small, round, oval, or bean-shaped structures. Their function is to filter interstitial fluid collected from tissue and return this to the vascular system. In transit, lymph nodes will trap foreign material such as viruses, bacteria, or cancer cells for handling by cells of the immune system, namely T and B cells. What does a lymph node look like on CT? Again, these are small, less than one centimeter shaped structures or sized structures dependent upon the orientation of the CT slice to the long axis of the lymph node, it will appear as either round or bean-shaped. Typically, they have smooth, well-defined margins, are homogeneous in density, and sometimes with a central fatty hilum. How are lymph nodes identified on CT? Well, based upon our knowledge of normal anatomy, we can identify the normal anatomic structures. And here I've outlined in red the aortic arch, in blue the SVC, in green the azagous vein, and in yellow the esophagus. And all remaining unidentified soft tissue structures in the mediastinum are lymph nodes. On the coronal reformatted image, we could go through the same anatomical exercise, or we could administer a intravenous contrast, which essentially opacifies the cardiovascular structures and rendering much more conspicuous the soft tissue structures in the mediastinum, which are lymph nodes. How are lymph nodes evaluated? Well, first, the characteristic we look at is size, and the criterion for abnormality is dependent on the clinical context. In patients in whom there is a high pretest probability of clinically important nodal disease, for example, a patient with known primary lung cancer, we would use a short axis size criterion of greater than one centimeter short axis. How is short axis diameter measured? Well, we identify the longest diameter of the lymph node, then we measure the longest perpendicular diameter to that, and that is defined as the short axis diameter, nine millimeters in this particular case. In patients in whom nodes are identified as an incidental finding, the size criteria for abnormality is increased to greater or equal to 1.5 centimeters in short axis. How are lymph nodes evaluated? Second characteristic we consider is density. And here I juxtapose four images one non-contrast and the other three contrast enhanced that show differing densities of lymph nodes. First image to your left shows a normal sized lymph node with a fatty hilum. We could put a region of interest and measure that low density center, which is minus 101 Hounsfield units, confirming its fatty nature. The next image shows even and homogeneous enhancement of the right paratracheal node which measures 48 Hounsfield units. The next image illustrates a hypervascular node in the prevascular space that is so bright that it approaches the density of the adjacent vascular structures and measures 138 Hounsfield units. And then the last image shows an enlarged right paratracheal node with an enhancing rim 
and a low attenuation central portion that measures 30 Hounsfield units and represents a necrotic lymph node. On non-contrast CTs, lymph nodes can sometimes be very dense, representing the presence of calcification. The pattern of nodal calcification, which may range from punctate to complete, is usually not of diagnostic significance, except in the scenario represented on the right coronal image. A lymph node showing a peripheral lamellar pattern of calcification, or so-called eggshell calcification, is characteristic of some diseases, such as silicosis in this particular case. The next characteristic to be considered is number and distribution of lymph nodes. Looking at the transverse image, a single enlarged left axillary node might, based upon our knowledge of lymphatic drainage pathways, lead us to consider a condition involving either the left upper extremity or anterior chest wall. However, given that the patient has got bilateral axillary as well as neck nodal disease, we now have to consider more diffuse or systemic processes such as hematologic malignancy in this particular case. For describing sites of nodal disease in the thorax, we employ most frequently the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, or IASLC, lymph node classification system that uses 14 nodal stations to stage lung cancer. In the course of your training, you will each become very familiar with the anatomic boundaries that define each of these stations. So now we come to this multiple choice question. Based upon your knowledge of nodal lymphatic drainage pathways, which is the most likely primary cancer causing this enlarged left internal mammary node in this 58-year-old woman? Is the primary cancer of lung origin, ovarian origin, breast origin, melanoma, or pancreas? So in this particular case, the left internal mammary node met is from the breast. And as some of you may have noticed, there is asymmetric soft tissue in the breast with this area actually representing the primary breast cancer. Other pitfalls we should be aware of in our, lip, in our nodal identification search pattern. Well, here's a case in point in which we see well-circumscribed crescentic areas of low attenuation posterior to the ascending aorta at the level of the left pulmonary artery. If you look carefully on the image to your right, you will appreciate that there is a similar appearing structure in the anterior mediastinum between the ascending aorta and the main pulmonary artery. And this, the, this structure actually represents a normal anatomy, which can be mistaken for a uh, intrapulmonary lymph node, but in fact represents the superior pericardial recess. How about this? Is this a mediastinal lymph node? We see a very well circumscribed, roughly round shaped structure with very low attenuation measuring in the water in the uh, Hounsfield units of water. In this particular case, again, we might mistake this for a mediastinal lymph node, but this actually represents a different type of mediastinal mass. In this particular case, in this young individual, it is a duplication cyst. And then last example, uh, we see a very well circumscribed soft tissue attenuation structure along the left mediastinum with an eccentric focus of very high attenuation causing streak artifact, suggestive to us that this uh, high density area is actually of metal origin. While on one transverse image, we might mistake this for a, a lymph node. I think if we were to scroll through this area, and particularly if we were to look at a coronal reformatted image, we would appreciate that this soft tissue structure actually corresponds to a tubular 
uh, finding that is along the left mediastinal border. On the corresponding chest radiograph, one would appreciate that the area causing streak artifact corresponds to the single pacemaker lead that is coming in through the left brachiocephalic area, down the left mediastinal margin, and it eventually terminates in the right ventricle. So uh, effectively, we see the pacemaker lead in an anomalous vessel, which in this case represents a persistent left-sided superior vena cava, uh, which occurs in approximately one in 200 individuals. The last topic that I'm going to discuss in this presentation is uh, of intrapulmonary lymph nodes. So intrapulmonary lymph nodes arise within an extensive lymphatic network that is found in the lung parenchyma. And the recognition and description of intrapulmonary lymph nodes was really greatly facilitated by the large-scale screening trials that occurred in North America and Europe in which intrapulmonary lymph nodes were identified somewhere between 20 to 25% of screening studies. On CT, intrapulmonary lymph nodes have a very characteristic appearance. They are solid, non-calcified nodules with sharp margins. They are usually round, oval, or polygonal in shape, typically quite small on the order of three to five millimeters in size, although they can be up to 1.5 centimeters in size. They are located in close proximity to pleural surfaces, often abutting them as seen in these two particular examples. And the vast majority are located inferior to the crina where the lymphatic network is most extensive. So let's consolidate our knowledge about the typical appearance of intrapulmonary lymph nodes by working together through these two cases. So in case number one, we see an abnormality in the right or lower lobe. It is 12 millimeters in size. It has an irregular margin. It is round in shape. It is cavitary in nature and it is located in the periphery of the right lower lobe. Based upon the characteristics of an irregular margin and cavitary texture, we would recognize that these are not typical features of an intrapulmonary lymph node, and this case was eventually proven to be an adenocarcinoma. Let's proceed to case number two. This finding is six millimeters in diameter, it has smooth margination. It is triangular in shape. It is homogeneously solid in texture and it is located in the periphery of the right middle lobe. All characteristics that are consistent with an intrapulmonary lymph node, which is what this finding represented. So in conclusion, I hope that I've been able to provide to you an approach for the systematic evaluation of thoracic lymph nodes, which is an important component in the interpretation of thoracic CT scans. Thank you very much for your attention.